So let me welcome you as we gather uh, to worship and seek the Lord together. And so I want to just challenge you to prepare your hearts to meet with God. As I say literally every week, it seems like, we should enter into his courts uh, together with praise and with thanksgiving, but with the expectation of hearing from God. And so we want to do our part in preparing our hearts to meet with him as we exalt the name of Jesus. So I want to share just a few passages of scripture with you to help you uh, just prepare your hearts to meet with God as we worship together. Philippians 4 uh, verses 4 through 7 uh, are just such powerful verses of scripture that many of us know by heart. But it says to rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It means that we're to, to rejoice in who God is and his goodness and his, his, his mercy and his grace that he lavishly pours on us day by day. We're to rejoice in him always because no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, we know we have a good God that loves us and that's for us and we're here today to celebrate him because of his goodness and how much he pours his love out towards us. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men for the Lord is at hand. We are to be marked not as angry people but people that are, are gentle, that we are praying and meeting with God and he's transforming our lives in the very image of his son. And then verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but with everything. What? Prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, once again, to be thankful, but let our requests be known to God. We're called uh, not to be marked by worry, but instead that of faith. God is in control. God is doing his thing. We're to let our requests, our supplications be known. We're to stand in the gap. We're to pray, but we're not to be overcome by worry. We're to be marked by a spirit of thanksgiving. God, we know that you're at work. We know that you are doing things in our midst. We may not know all that you're working, your workings and all that you're doing. We may not be able to see it all, but we know that you're at work. And because of that, we're going to th be thankful. We're going to worship you. We're going to give our lives to you because, God, we know how good you are and we've seen your faithful hand at work in our lives. And then verse 7 says that the peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to not focus on the things of the world. We're not going to fix our eyes on our problems. We're going to focus and fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to drown out the distractions. And we're going to get lost in worshiping Him. Not on ourselves and what we can get out of it, but what we can offer back to Him. And as we do that together, watch God bless you today as you exalt the name of Jesus and as we worship Him together. So thank you for being here. Let's open up in a word of prayer. And let's fix our minds, our hearts, our thoughts on Jesus as we seek his face. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for allowing us to connect and to worship and to just exalt your name. So help us to fix and focus our eyes on Jesus and get lost in who you are. Thank you, God, for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercy. And Lord, we bless your name. In Christ's name, amen. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas great. That taught my heart to fear In grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone Mercy reigns Unending 
In His providence, God works all things according to His plan. Even more amazing is God's ability to transform what was meant for evil into good. When Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers, God's purpose became evident to all. In their hatred, the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. In their fear, they hid the truth of their actions from their father. And yet God used this evil for good to preserve his people and uphold his covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The chain of events that began with Joseph's dreams of grandeur now comes to a joyful resolution. Joseph revealed himself, and not with vengeance, but with mercy. His trust in God's sovereignty throughout his life allowed him to see God's purpose through it all. Joseph's disclosure of his identity also led to his reunion with Jacob. Imagine his anticipation and longing to see his father again. Envision Jacob overcome with emotion and seeing Joseph again. His beloved son is not only alive, but his favor with Pharaoh has saved the family from ruin. Come with us as Joseph reconciles with his brothers, embraces his father, and declares God's purpose in it all. So hopefully you have your Bibles. If you do, go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 45 as we are continuing our study on the life of Joseph. And as we're walking through this, one of the things that we've said week in and week out uh, is that our theme verse and what we see playing out over Joseph's life is that of Romans uh, 8.28. And it simply says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those are called according to his purpose. And we're seeing this truth played out right before our eyes as we study and examine the life of Joseph and all that he walked through. We see God at work, even though at times in Joseph's life, it may seem, at least to Joseph, God, where are you and what are you doing? And so there has been so much application that we have gleaned from this study together. And maybe one of the, the greatest is for us just to have patience and endure and trust in God, and walk by faith, even when he's not making a whole lot of sense to us at the moment. And so I'll remind you last week, we left off with Joseph's brothers, especially Judah, but his brothers, demonstrating their true repented heart for what they had done to Joseph by their faithfulness to Benjamin and their loyalty and love for their father. And so Joseph's identity has been hid up to this point, but seeing the transformation on their lives, literally, Joseph is, is about to explode because of, of just wanting to, to tell his brothers who he is. And that's exactly what happens in chapter 45. And so read with me in the first eight verses as Joseph reveals who he is to his brothers after they've passed the test or the testing that he's put, put them through. Um, over the last two sermons that we've looked at. But look at verse 1 of chapter 45. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before those who stood before him. That's his brothers. And he cried out. He said, make everyone leave the room. Everybody's got to go. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He, he cleared the room. He cleared the house. He wanted no one there but his brothers. But the commotion and the, the noise and all the, the tears that, that was shed was so great that he wept out loud, verse 2 tells us, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. I mean, there was that much commotion and emotions that were being shared. And, and could you imagine 20 years of being severed from your family, 20 years of hurt and thinking that a situation is, is such as a relationship with your father and your brother, brothers is, is just done, it's over with, it could never happen again. And then here God is resurrecting this and, and answering so many of the, the, the dreams that, that God had given Joseph, the two dreams of explaining to him that one day this was going to happen. And all of a sudden God's at work and there's much emotion and there's much celebration. We're going to see this today in our, our study and in our time together. There's much celebration of what's taking place. Notice verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, he says, I am Joseph. 
And he says, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. And so they came near, and then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me here, sent me before you to preserve your life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you, for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now... It was not you who sent me here, but God. And he, he has made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his house and ruler throughout the land of Egypt. No doubt when Joseph reveals his identity as brothers, their hearts sink into their chest because they naturally expect him to, to pay them back with, with vengeance. But Joseph is not full of vengeance. He's full of grace and mercy. Joseph has come to, to understand that, that it was God that sent him to Egypt, not necessarily his brothers. God used even their, their foolishness to accomplish his purpose. And so there's two observations that really seem similar, but, but they, they cover two different aspects that, that I think we can glean from this. Number one, God can work through suffering to accomplish his purpose in our lives. God can, can work through, through suffering. Joseph went through a lot of suffering. But God was at work preparing him for this time, for this moment. For him to have the, the skills and the, the wisdom and the platform to be his man. To not only save the nation of Israel, but also to, to save many in the world and, and to just be a blessing to the world. And so God took him through much. To prepare him for what was to transpire as far as the purpose that God has for his life. And so what this means is that the pain that we suffer, even when evil is done towards us, is not in vain. You think, oh, man, I, my heart's broken. I'm going through this agony. I'm suffering. It just looks like the, the, the guilty party is just getting away with it. And, and here I am suffering. Why is God allowing me to suffer? And so I'll remind you of this. If you are God's child and you love God and you can claim eight, Romans 8, 28, that God will work all things out, right? For the good, for those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. So get this. If that's you and it's true, I don't care what you're walking through. Your pain has a purpose. Your pain has a purpose. God's not just going to allow you to walk through that for the sake of just allowing you to walk through that. He is doing something. You may can't not see it. You may say, well, it's been going on forever. What can God do now? This is a hopeless situation. You are not walking through it for nothing. Your pain has a purpose. Your pain has a purpose. And so God can work through suffering to accomplish his purpose. And in that, we have to understand that our pain has a purpose. All that Joseph has gone through had a purpose. And there was much God was doing, and there's much that God is doing in your life and he wants you to trust him and walk by faith and if those are true then we have to come to this conclusion too if we truly believe this that our pain has a purpose then we won't have an issue forgiving we won't have an issue of extending mercy or grace Especially when we get put in those situations, the ones that have caused us the most harm and the most heartache, when we see the brokenness and we see the repentance before them. To be able to not only exercise forgiveness, but especially when there's repentance and brokenness, to be able to extend and bring rest restoration and reconciliation. Listen, Joseph's pain had a purpose. And because Joseph had his eyes fixed on the Lord and he could see that, he had no issue forgiving. Friends, many times we struggle with forgiveness is because we don't think that our pain and the things we walk through have a purpose and we don't think God can still accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish. And so we lose sight of that and we become very bitter and just angry people. But we got to push past that. 
And we got to realize that we serve a God that's so much bigger, so much greater than that. Matter of fact, it brings me to the second observation. It will sound much like the first, but there's some difference. It says sometimes the wicked actions of others enables God to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Sometimes the wicked actions of others enables God to fulfill his purpose in our lives. And, and so let me try to explain this just for a moment of the point that I'm trying to make. Listen, God is sovereign. He, he's, he's in control. He's, he's doing his thing. But in his sovereignty, and this is a very complex issue that, that so many uh, people argue and they, they, they grumble and gripe and, and, and there's so much division even in the body of Christ of trying to explain this. And so I don't want to attempt like I've got God figured out, but, but here's what I know. God, in one hand, allows men to have free choice and responsibility for their actions and holds them accountable for that. But even in that, God still accomplishes his sovereign purpose and he can use man's sinful action to do that, actions to do that and hold them accountable and, and, and lead us on the path that, that he wants us to go. For example, Joseph's brothers were, were just overwhelmed with, with envy and bitterness and, and anger and they, the hostility. And they hated Joseph so much with this jealous envy that they wanted to kill him. But instead, they decided to sell him into slavery. And he ended up in Egypt. And through that path, he ended up where he is. God needed Joseph in Egypt. That was God's plan the whole time. But just because it was God's plan does not mean that God perpetrated the evil that was in these brothers' hearts. No, that was their own free will. That was their choice. And God is going to hold them accountable for that if, if they didn't repent and turn to faith in Him. God, God, I mean, that was what they did. But nevertheless, God used that to accomplish His purpose in their lives. Let me give you another example. Revelation uh, 13.8 says that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the earth. Before Christ ever walked onto the scene, it was already determined that he was going to be crucified for the world. But yet, Judas made the choice to reject and to betray our Lord. The high priests and, and, and the religious leaders that, that led the charge to see Christ crucified, every one of them are accountable for their sin, Pontius Pilate, all of that. And God used their sinful actions to accomplish his purpose and could still hold them accountable because of their sin and because they were wrong with what they did and what they planned and perpetrated in their heart, but their evil does not override what God wants to accomplish in our lives. And so step back and think about this just for a moment. God can take other people's sin and wickedness and he can use it and even our sufferings to, to, to break us and mold us and shape us to accomplish His good will and purpose in our lives to ultimately, and here's the point, to ultimately get to the point to where we become blessings to others. Joseph is telling his brothers, yes, you, you meant it for evil, and I know you're worried because you think I'm going to have all this vengeance towards you, but here's what I've come to figure out. God allowed this to happen. He doesn't do evil. James makes it clear. God doesn't sin, and God is the God that gives good gifts to his children, not bad. You, though, meant it for evil. Joseph speaking to his brother. You meant it for harm, but, but get this. I'm not mad at you because God's used that to get me where he needed me to be to where I could be a blessing to you and ultimately to the world. And so, friends, think about what you're walking through. Think about even what's taking place in our nation right now. We should be standing in the gap. We should be praying. We should be agonizing. We should be crying. And I'm just to be really honest with you. That is where I have been this last week, just praying and agonizing for our nation because I see major, major trouble ahead. But in that, I'm not overcome with worry and fear because I know in all of this, even with sinful men and, and their wicked actions and Satan at work trying to bring destruction, I know this. God is at work. And God is doing His thing to set up the stage. And what I am praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, bring about a spiritual movement Bring about an awakening. And if that means brokenness, because I don't believe it can happen apart from that, then that's exactly what needs to happen. God, open our eyes and help us see. 
Joseph got to the point where he got the big picture. And because of that, I think it was easy for him to forgive. Even though it cost him so much. Even though the pain was that real. And so I'll just remind you, I don't know what you're walking through. I have no idea what you're facing, and I am certainly not minimizing it. But your pain has a purpose. And if your pain has a purpose, and God can accomplish his purpose in your life and through your life, he's just saying, stay the course, keep the faith. I don't care if it's been 20 years. I'm still doing my thing. Trust me. Friends, we got to do it. And as we read scripture, remember we said we want to hear from God today. This is if I believe God is saying, stay the course. I'm with you. If I can do it in Joseph, I can do it in you. And I can do it through you. And so there's this celebration that's taking place. And, and Joseph ends up telling his brothers to, to, to go back home and to, to get, get our father and, and bring the whole household back and come stay in Egypt because this famine is far from over. And it's going to get worse. And God's put me here to protect and provide for you. Now I'm going to go ahead and say this, and we're going to say, that, say I'm going to say it again before we close today. But let me say it, because it needs to be hammered home. When God blesses a person, he doesn't bless us for the sake of just blessing us, for the blessing to be all about us and to just be self-centered people. If that's the case, then what ends up happening is self-idolatry. We just begin to worship self, narcissism. But when God blesses a person or a man, it's always to be a blessing to others. If God blesses you financially, he's blessing you for you to use that to be a blessing to others. When God blesses, we're to be a conduit in which his blessings flow through. Joseph realizes that's who he is, and that's where God's placed him. And so he wants his family to come back and to be able to stay with him in Egypt under this intense time and this severe famine that's taking place uh, on the land. And so notice what um, what transpires in verses 25 through uh, 27. 25 through 27. It says, Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan, to Jacob their father. The brothers are headed back home. It says, And they uh, told him, saying, Could you imagine, by the way, what this conversation would have been like? Could you imagine the fear over these brothers, knowing that they've got to go look their father in the eye and tell them that they have lied to, the, to, to their father about Joseph and what really happened. By the way, this right here is one of the greatest signs of the repentance on the brothers' lives than maybe anything else because they're willing to go back and they're, to tell the, they're, they're going to tell their father the truth of what happened. Before we can ever be released from our past in order to go forward in our future, we've got to go back and we've got to deal with our past and we've got to be willing to take ownership with it. And they're finally at that place to where they're going to go back and they're going to tell their father all that's taken place. And I'll tell you something. Going back in order to go, fu- go forward and go to the future, move forward with God, it can be a scary, scary thing. But here's my promise to you. I promise you, been there, done it, more than I'd like to account or admit. When we're willing to do it, It's as if God always goes before us and it always works out. Because God gives grace, what? To the humble, but he resists the proudful. And so they're going back. They say to him, Joseph is still alive and he's the governor of all of the land of Egypt. And notice that what happened to Jacob says that his heart stood um, still before them, for he did not believe them. It was just so overwhelming for him. He says, because he couldn't believe him, when they told him all the words of what Joseph said to them, he went and saw the carts which Joseph had sent uh, to carry him. The spirit of Jacob, their father, was revived. He was on cloud nine. Jacob saw the hand of God, and it brought life to him. And so this brings me to the third observation. And I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again. And this is huge because I don't care what you're walking through. I don't care 
how hopeless of a situation you may be in. I don't care how much energy you've tried. I don't care how many prayers you've prayed, how many tears you've cried. It's never over. It's never over. You said, but you don't understand. I've lost a loved one. It's still not over. It's still not over. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever comes to me, right? You're going to have life if you've trusted your faith in Christ. God is a God who majors in the resurrection. And there may be some situations that you think are absolutely hopeless and you have no idea what God's going to do. You have no idea what God's going to do. You have no idea who God may bring to salvation through it or what God may do through it. You have no idea. And I think that when the time comes, so when we get to glory and we get to to see our Lord and meet with our Lord and we get to, to just talk with Him and begin to see and understand how much He was working and what He was doing behind the scenes on things that we could never even imagine and even what was accomplished through some of our darkest times and darkest days, I think we're going to be absolutely blown away. And it's almost going to be like, I get it, God. I, I get it. I, I was suffering here because you were working in this person over there. I was suffering here because you, you were stripping this out of me. Or maybe you were doing something over here. And it's just going to blow our minds how much our God is involved in our personal lives. Guys, we don't serve a God who's distant who is uninvolved, that's just, you know, just, just wound up a clock and just letting it flow. No, God is involved in the very small, mundane aspects of our life. He, he cares about it all. The big, the small, and the in-between. He's a very personal God. And aren't you thankful for that? So, third observation, our God majors in the resurrection. He just brought about resurrection in Jacob's life. Totally unexpected. Blown him away. And by the way, remember Joseph was put, excuse me, Jacob was put before him. Two, two options about sending Benjamin to um, Egypt. And we talked about it last week. There were two options that were put before him. And neither one of them were, <laughs> looked good on the surface. One, don't let him go. Lose Simeon. Let his family starve to death. Two, let him go to Egypt, and every time somebody goes to Egypt in his family, whether it was his grandfather, his father, or his son, it, it ne- sons, it never turned out good. And he had the chance of losing Benjamin. So, so there was no good option on the table, but he had to make a choice. And so he chose to let him go. And, and, and when he did, look at what God did. Look at the path that God paid for him. Look at the way God blessed him. Ways that he could not ever have imagined. So when we've got to make a decision and we don't know what to do, and we pray and we ask God and we know that we've got to take a step. We ask Him for guidance. We ask Him for wisdom. We will do that. We will leave the results in His hands and watch what He will do. More often than not, watch what He will do in those situations. And so we see this taking place. And so Jacob makes the decision to go see his son. And so there's been this restoration, this reconciliation, and now Jacob's heart has been revived and it's time for him to go see his boy. And so as he packs up and he heads, verse 1 of chapter 46 says that, so Israel, that's Jacob, took his journey with all that he had. And he came to Beersheba and he offered sacrifices to God, the God of his fa- um, to, to the God of his father Isaac. And then God spoke to Israel in a vision of the night. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. So get this. He's headed to Egypt, but before he's going to get to Egypt, he's going to stop at a familiar place, and he's going to worship. He's going to worship God, and there he's going to have an encounter with God as he's worshiping, and he's crying out to him, and he's thanking him for his goodness and wanting his favor to continue to be upon his life. And God speaks to him, calls him by name, Jacob, Jacob, and he says, here I am. By the way, that's the way we need to respond to God when we hear from Him. When he hears, you hear, Kevin, Kevin. It's like, God, God, I'll be there in a few minutes after I get through with playing on my phone. Or, Kevin, Kevin. God, God, I'll be there in a few minutes after I get through watching this TV show. 
When God is stirring in our hearts because He wants to meet with us, our response should be, as it is in Scripture for so many of the saints, here I am, Lord. You have my full attention. I'm here. Speak, God. Speak. Speak to me, Lord. And so he says, I am God, the God of your Father. And then he says these interesting words. He says, do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. And I will go down with you to Egypt. Notice that God's going to go with him. God's going to go with him. Nowhere, no matter where we go, our God's there. Why? Because he's a good, personal God that is with us through thick and thin. He says, I'll go down there with you. He says to Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hands on your eyelids. Speaking of the fact that you will die there, but you will die with the fact that Joseph will be in your company and he'll be the very one that closes your eyes. What, what a promise God is giving to Jacob here right now. So let me, let me say this. Jacob is overwhelmed with the fact that he gets to go see his long lost son. But equally, he's a little bit nervous about going to Egypt. There has been nothing good come out of Egypt for Jacob and his family. His grandfather Abraham went down there and he had to lie or he ended up lying. Um, and we've seen where, where it caused much hardship and heartache for the family. Isaac goes, his father goes down to Egypt, gets in kind of the same thing. I mean, there's just, Egypt hasn't been a good place for Jacob. And so he's going to Egypt. And by the way, Egypt is, is a picture of the world. He's going to Egypt, and as he's going there, he's, he's, he's fearful. But in the same sense, he's overwhelmed with joy because he knows that his son Joseph is there. And so in that, God gives him this promise. And he knows that, that his promises in Canaan, as far as building a great nation, it's not, it's not in Egypt. He's living in his inheritance, but now he's going to Egypt. God says, I'm going to go with you. Joseph is going to be there. I'm at work. Trust me. So let me give you this fourth observation. When God moves, when he, he reveals himself, and it's these just, just blown away moments, uh, not, not just little things, I'm just talking about major breakthrough, and you're just at awe. In one sense, it will, will, will blow you away to the point to where you just become so excited about life and about what God's doing. You just want to jump for joy, and, and you just want to scream to the, to the, to the rooftops of what, God has done and what he's doing and the breakthrough he's given you. But on the flip side of that, there's always going to be this challenge of faith because he, now that you've had this breakthrough, you know you've got to walk through and accomplish what God is leading you to do. And there's always those moments where fear will creep in. All of a sudden he knows he's got to go to Egypt, but, but he's a little bit nervous about going to Egypt. He's a little bit nervous about taking, taking that next step. And so when God moves, it often brings excitement, and fear. But our response has to be to trust him and to worship him. He goes to Beersheba. He worships God. He gets lost in who God is. God appears to him, speaks to him, says, I'm with you. Go. I'm with you. Go. So maybe your breakthrough comes. You're blown away. You know exactly where God's leading you to go. You you, you're, you're ready to do it, but then all of a sudden, oh man, what, 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 are, what are all the, the what ifs? It's kind of like Peter walking on the water and the waters are raging. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he, he had plenty of faith and he could do the impossible. But when he started looking at what he was doing, fear crept in and he began to sink. You're going to have to step out in faith. You're going to have to take God at his word. And you do that by worshiping him and trusting him. Jacob's doing that. And in that, he's going to head to Egypt. And he's going to have an encounter with his son. And there's going to be a great reunion. There's going to be great blessings. He's going to send Judah ahead of him. And he's going to meet with Joseph. And Joseph is going to give him some, some really pertinent information about what to say before Pharaoh when he goes before Pharaoh. They end up doing that. 
telling Pharaoh they're, they're shepherds. Pharaoh ends up blessing the whole family. God's in this, gives them the choice land. Jacob ends up going before Pharaoh and even blessing Pharaoh. And God just, just works it all out. Why? Because God is in Egypt with Jacob, with Joseph. I always say this, that, that, that wherever I go, I want God leading the way. Just as he did in the Old Testament with the Shekinah glory cloud. Lead, Father, and, and let me follow. I'd rather be one step behind God instead of two or three steps ahead of him because I want to follow his leading. And so God is just working all this out. And he's bringing about some pretty powerful things in, in, Jacob's, in Joseph's life. So notice in chapter 47 what verse 12 says. Then Joseph provided his father, his brother, and all of his father's household with bread according to the numbers of their family. The whole family ended up there. If you add Joseph in the mix and all of that, it's 70 people, and they're provided for. And this famine is just getting worse and worse. So much that Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph, will ultimately get to the point of where all of Egypt, will, 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 their land will belong to, to Pharaoh because of having to rely on what the provision that Joseph put up for Pharaoh to be able to minister to the people to keep them alive. And so Pharaoh is blessed because of uh, Joseph as well. And Joseph is really a savior, not only to his family, but, but to the world because of where God has placed him. Now, as we bring this to a close, I'm just going to remind you again, you have no idea who you'll ultimately be a blessing to because of your faithfulness. Joseph had no idea. But you know what God is painting a beautiful picture of in Joseph's life? It was the life of Christ that was to come to where he was going to come and go before and his brothers, and, and, and before the world, he would bear the cross. He would bear our sin and our shame, and he would bring salvation to whoever would believe. And he is, Joseph is a picture of Christ, showing the great sacrifice that he's gone through and went through for salvation of men. And so I want to say it once again, you have no idea how God may use your story to point people to the Savior. Friends, if your pain has a purpose, then you can forgive and you can let go and you can get to the place where you worship because you want to make much of the name of Jesus. Now, what say you this day? You've heard the message we worship. We've asked God to speak to us. What say you? How do you respond? Are you going to be disengaged and full of apathy and just kind of go through the motions? Or are you going to say, though he slay me, yet I'll trust him because I know he's doing his thing. God, here I am. Let me be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Let me be the hands and let me be the feet. Friends, I hope that you're willing to walk by faith and trust in Christ. Now, if you've, and live for Christ. And now, if you've never trusted in Christ as your Savior, let me say this before we close. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And the only thing that keeps you from having a relationship with God is you. God's paved the way. The Bible makes it very clear. For God so loved the world, and you can put your name there, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that if you would believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. It's as simple as acknowledging you're a sinner and that Christ has died for you and receive him by faith. His, this precious gift of salvation. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, if you've never trusted Jesus, would you be willing to cry out in your heart, God, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin separates me from you and is deserving of death, but I also know that you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die in my stead, my place. And would you say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Please save me, and please give me life. Friends, if you'll pray that prayer, all of heaven is rejoicing because you pass from death into life. And not only will God forgive you, 
but he'll literally come and live inside of you and you become born again. The Spirit of God will come live inside of you and give you life that you may walk with God for all time's sake. Friends, if you've done that, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those that are engaged, those that are watching, those that are worshiping with us. Father, for those that may be receiving Christ for the very first time and receiving Him as their Savior, God, may you make yourself real to them and known to them. May you bless them. May you bring transformation. And Lord, may we connect with them as a church to help them grow. Equally, Father, for those that are walking through troubling times, God, may this passage of Scripture that we've studied be a word of encouragement to them, to strengthen and encourage them, and to help them walk with Christ. Lord, thank you for what you're doing, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord has promised God.